Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the women. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He isn't here. He has risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come see where his body was lying. And now, go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. The women ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened, but also filled with great joy, and they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them, and they ran to him, grasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. Fear is not the usual emotion that we associate with Easter. When we think of Easter and maybe the emotions of Easter, uh, we might think about excitement, excitement for Jesus' people to celebrate his resurrection. And we might think of the emotion of enthusiasm for all the kids to find those Easter eggs or get those Easter baskets. We might even think of the emotion of eagerness for all the men to finally be able to wear pastel colors and feel good about themselves. <laughs> right? I mean, Easter, we can think of a lot of emotions, but fear is not usually one of them unless maybe you're a young child meeting the Easter bunny for the first time, right? Look at, look at a couple of these pictures I have for you. Look at these two poor girls, right? They're just trying to get away. Uh, here's another one. Now, I'm not sure if that girl is more frightened by the Easter bunny or her brother's response. Like, I'm not... Sure, and then this is one of my favorites. Look at this one. That boy hated it in 2015 and 2016. But sister is just happy as can be. And then here's one more. This poor girl not having a good time either. Now, I'm gonna show you another picture in a moment. That, that all the pictures I just showed you, these kids were scared. But in the next photos, the kids aren't. But I think they should be. Look at these Easter bunnies. Is that terrible? I mean, look at the one in the middle. It's like, murder you Easter bunny. What is going on? And that girl is smiling. I, that's crazy. Now, anyway, other than those photos, fear is not the usual emotion that we associate with Easter. Yet, did you see how present fear was that very first Easter morning in the scripture that was just read to us? Fear was very present. The guards at the tomb guarding Jesus, they almost literally were scared to death. It says that, that they, they fell over, meaning they passed out from fear when the angels showed up. And then when Mary and Mary came to the tomb and saw an angel, they were obviously afraid, as you would be, because the first thing the angel said to them was, do not be afraid. And then even after Mary Magdalene heard that Jesus was alive, fear was still present. Because when she first saw the resurrected Christ, when Jesus showed up on that path, when she was running to tell the other disciples that Jesus was alive and Jesus shows up to her, the first words Jesus says to her is don't be afraid. But did you catch in verse eight, that after she heard Jesus was alive, fear was not the only emotion present. Let me show it to you again in verse eight, if you'll put that up on the screen. Here's what that scripture verse said, and I wanna let you know, anytime today you see a word bolded in the scripture verse, feel free to join me in saying that out loud. In verse eight, it said they, Mary and Mary, were very frightened, but also filled with great joy. Frightened? and filled with joy. Why were they frightened? Because everything they saw and just heard, they had no per frame of reference for. 
right? The resurrection, like nothing like this had ever happened before. You and I show up here today on Easter, and even if you're here today and you're not a Jesus follower, you just had to come to be able to get lunch, all right? Even if that's your story, you've probably heard of the Christian claim that Jesus is alive and that he didn't stay in the grave. And so you and I show up to Easter with a frame of reference. Mary had no frame of reference. This had never happened before. And so she's frightened because everything she saw and heard was absolutely out of the realm of possibility. But she is now filled with joy because if indeed Jesus is alive, you know what that means? It means he is the savior. It means the king is back. It means that the Jesus community that had died on Friday with Jesus' death on the cross was not in fact gone, in fact, it was just getting started. You see, this is the fearful joy of Easter, that Jesus died and he rose from the grave. We remember the cross and an empty tomb, death and resurrection, fearful joy. Are you familiar with the term mixed bag? If somebody says, oh, it's a mixed bag, they mean it's all sorts. There's some good, some bad, some positive, some negative. You would use the term mixed bag in a sentence like this. Um, Being a San Diego Padres fan is a mixed bag. (laughs) Right? Every year we start with a little bit of hope and excitement, followed by large doses of disappointment. (laughs) Right? Every year it's a mixed bag. That's how you would do it. But here's the truth. Isn't life really a mixed bag? I mean, isn't all of our lives this journey of highs and lows, ups and downs, joys and sorrow, faith and doubt, fear and hope. I think all of us show up in life and in different seasons of life really is a mixed bag. It's fearful joy. When I think of this idea of fearful joy, uh, it reminds me of my daughter's experience when she was little at Disneyland. Uh, My wife and I have three kids. Here's a picture of our family uh, from just this last Christmas. I have three teenagers, so feel free to pray for me um, and my wife. Uh, But uh, when my kids were really little, uh, we had Disneyland passes. This is back before uh, Disney passes cost the same as a mortgage, okay? Um, But when my kids were really little, like this little, if you remember these stages, um, right there, that's, you know, them falling asleep after a really fun day at Disneyland. Uh, But when my kids were really little and we had these Disney passes, Uh, For my daughter, Disney was this place of fearful joy because it was a mixed bag for her. She liked the age-appropriate rides. She loved the $25 churros. Um, (laughs) She liked the Disney characters that had regular people faces. So princesses, Tinkerbell, all the people that look like regular people, she was fine with. But any Disney character walking around that had a mask or like a big head or a fake face, she would freak out. She would scream. She'd run in another direction. She'd want to hide in the stroller. Like, because they, so, you know, uh, Mickey Mouse, Minnie, Goofy, like even Winnie the Pooh, like all those, she would lose it. And so we were there one day and we had just gotten off of Storybook Ride, if you know where that is, in the Disney park. Um, And I saw across the crowd of people, because I'm like six foot two, and I saw Captain Hook making his way towards us. And my daughter's like this tall. She can't see through the crowds of people. And so I did at that moment what any good parent would do. I just sat back and said, this should be fun. Let's see what happens. (laughs) Don't judge. Some of you, you're a good parent like me too. And So I just kind of let it happen. And I'm like, so she's just standing there and thinks everything's fine. And Captain Hook's getting closer and closer. And sure enough, all of a sudden the people part and she turns around and she is face to face with Captain Hook in this big, you know, I mean, like he's about the scariest Disney character. And guess what she did at that moment? Exactly what I thought she would do. She screamed and took off running. And that was the last time I ever saw her. No, I didn't. I eventually caught up with her in like Long Beach. Um, (laughs) No, I went and and got her. And here's my point in telling you that. For my daughter, Disney was always this mix of fearful joy. You know, as we come to Easter, God doesn't want us to have a fear that causes us to run away from him. In fact, everything that we're remembering and celebrating on Easter 
the death of Jesus on the cross, his resurrection from the grave, all of those things were done so that we can run to him easier, not run away from him. God welcomes us to him. That's what this is all about, that we can run to the Lord. When Mary Magdalene first saw Jesus on that path and she was running to tell the other disciples, she pushed past fear and ran towards joy. And it was at Jesus' feet as she worshiped him. Once again, she heard those words, don't be afraid. And so if you're showing up here this Easter with a mixed bag of emotions today, here's what I want to tell you. Welcome to the club. <laughs> if, if you're showing up and you will go, hey, not everything in my life this Easter is full of joy or peace or goodness, welcome to the club. And the good news of Easter is that Jesus shows up in the middle of this mixed bag of life that we all experience. And he shows up in the middle of our fear and he says, don't be afraid, peace be with you. You see, after Mary Magdalene encountered the resurrected Jesus, he calmed her fears and he sent her to share the good news with others. And can you imagine at that moment the joy Mary Magdalene felt? having seen the resurrected Christ, the first to see the resurrected Christ. If you know anything about her story in scripture, I know she would have been filled with joy because Jesus had rescued her and saved her out of so much in her life that had her bound up. Jesus set her free, gave her a new purpose, and welcomed her. She was one of the insiders in this new Jesus community. And so when she sees Jesus, she realizes the king is back. He is the savior. He is the Messiah. He's the one we had always hoped and dreamed of. I think what she would have felt is expressed in this next song that you're going to hear. This next song you're going to hear is titled, These Are the Days. And I think as Mary was running to tell the other disciples that Jesus is alive, the king has returned, you're gonna hear a lyric in the song that says, the dark skies are gone, they are no more. The dark skies that covered God's people on that Friday when Jesus died, on Easter the sun was out and the skies were blue and Mary's heart was full because for her and every person who had ever hoped and prayed for the Messiah, the savior of the world, these are the days they had been dreaming of.
That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again he said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. The good news of Easter is that locked doors can't keep Jesus out any more than a large stone can keep him in. It was Sunday evening that scripture said, and the disciples weren't celebrating that their savior is alive. What were they doing? Hiding out in a locked room. Remember, what what did we just read earlier? It was Sunday morning and Jesus showed himself to Mary and said, go tell them I'm alive. And we know from the gospel of Mark that Mary told them, Hey, Jesus is alive. In fact, Peter and another disciple ran all the way to the tomb. But here's the problem. They didn't believe her. (laughs) And Jesus is free, but the disciples have imprisoned themselves in a room in fear. The tomb is empty, but the hideout is full. But the good news of Easter is that the resurrected of Christ can do things no one else can do. Locked doors can't keep them out. You see, Jesus was natural enough that when he showed up in that room, they could touch his hands and see his wounds, but he was supernatural enough that he could just show up into that space without coming through the door. You see, Jesus shows up in the middle of their fear, and what he does for them is that he does three things. Did you catch it in that little scripture passage we just read? It said that Jesus, the first thing he did was he said to them, peace be with you. The second thing that he did is he breathed on them, giving them his Holy Spirit. And then the third thing he did was he sent them out to share the good news. That now everybody can be reconciled and restored back into a relationship with God. Because Jesus is alive. Because Jesus is alive, we can be alive, spiritually now and forever with him. And so the three things that the resurrected Christ did for those first disciples is what he wants to do for each of us. You see, the resurrected Christ gives us peace, power, and purpose. That's what Jesus gives us. He gives us peace, he gives us power, he gives us purpose. And I think like the disciples, many of us, have probably built up some walls and locked up some things in our heart. And we've kept Jesus away from certain things. And what Jesus has the ability to do and what he wants to do today is show up in some of those deepest, darkest places where maybe we're living in fear or we think we've locked Jesus out. And he wants to come and he wants to give us peace and he wants to give us power and he wants to give us purpose. And so let me quickly walk through these three things that the resurrected Christ gave those first disciples because of the same three things that Jesus wants to give us today. The first is this, Jesus gives us peace over fear. He gives us peace over fear. I love that the first thing Jesus said to those disciples when he showed up was not, really guys? (laughs) The first thing Jesus said to those disciples wasn't, you should all be ashamed of yourselves. Right? I mean, they, they were in, like, like lock, literally locked up in a room because of their fear. No, the first thing Jesus showed up and said was what? Peace be with you. And I think many of us have locked Jesus out, or maybe we've run from God because we think that if we come to God or we maybe open our heart a little bit, the first thing he's going to do is shame us, blame us, or judge us. And Easter is this incredible reminder that we have a God who doesn't come to us in this moment in history right now. He's not coming to us pointing a judgmental finger. But we have a God and we have a Savior who comes to us with arms wide open of love. That it is that love for us that sent him to a cross. To die in our place. To become the once and for all sacrifice for all. That's the kind of God we have. That's how much he loves us. And he does that because he wants to bring us peace. And the peace that Jesus offered those first disciples that day is the same peace that he offers us. And it is a peace that he secured on the cross. Look at what Colossians 1 says. This scripture says, God was pleased to have all of himself live in Christ 
And God was also pleased to bring everything on earth and in heaven back to himself through Christ. He did this by making peace through Christ's blood sacrificed on the cross. You see, that scripture tells us that God is the initiator of peace, that he made a way for us to be forgiven and have peace with God through what Christ did for us on the cross. I think a lot of us wrongly think that we have to be the initiator of peace with God. But that scripture tells us that God went first, that he initiated peace way before we ever made a move towards him. He was thinking of us way before we ever thought of him. You see, some of us think that we have to initiate peace in the way of, well, you know, if I could get my life together, if I could overcome this struggle, if I could maybe live a little better, then I could have the peace of God. That's the exact opposite of what scripture teaches. You see, God shows up in the middle when we're living wrong, when we're locked up in our fear, when we're locked up in our sin, when we're locked up in our selfishness, when we're locked up in our addictions, and he offers us peace. He offers us something supernatural. And so the first thing God does is he offers us his peace. And the second thing that Jesus does is this. He gives us power for our weakness. He gives us peace over our fears and he gives us power for our weakness. Did you catch that second kind of weird thing that Jesus did? After he said, peace be with you, it says he breathed on them. That's kind of strange, right? Was it like a death breath check? (sighs) I mean, he had been dead for three days, probably could have used a Tic Tac at that point, maybe a box, right? Like, what was he doing breathe on him? It seems really weird. The idea, whenever you see in scripture where it says God breathed on them, or in this case, Jesus breathed on them, it's, it's meaning that God is imparting, or in this case, Jesus was imparting and giving his spirit to them. That word breathed is actually, it's the same idea and the same word used at the very beginning of the Bible story in the creation narrative where it says after God created human beings, the last step of our creation was that God breathed into us his life, making us a living soul. It's what sets us apart of all other creation. It's the part that makes us godlike, that we are an eternal being with a living soul made to live forever in relationship with God. And so this idea, when it says Jesus breathed on them, what Jesus was doing was he was imparting, he was giving his Holy Spirit to them. This was the disciples' moment of salvation. This was their redemption. This was their regeneration moment. The same spirit that had empowered everything Jesus had said and done was now given to his disciples, and it was in them. Look at what this next scripture teaches about God's spirit in all believers who would believe and follow Jesus. Look at this, Romans 8, 11. The spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives where? In you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living where? Within you. You see, the same presence and power of God that raised Jesus from the dead is placed inside of every single believer when we believe and follow Jesus. Scripture teaches that before we say yes to Christ, God's spirit is outside of us and his spirit is working on us. His spirit is trying to get us to believe and see the goodness and the grace of God. God's spirit is trying to help us to see his goodness and his blessing in our life. He's trying to open up our ears to be able to hear and understand the good news that because Jesus is alive, so can we. And that our relationship with God isn't based on some religious ladder we have to try to ascend to, to get to God, but we have a savior who became one of us to show us what real love looks like, who sacrificed his life on a cross, who became sin so that we could be forgiven. And simply through the act of believing faith, we receive and we are made alive in Christ and a promise that we will be resurrected and live with God forever. That's the good news of the gospel. And once we say yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit that was working on us now lives inside of us. This is what scripture teaches. And because the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives inside of us, here's what that means. It means that you and I can have hope that we can change because it's not about our power or our ability. It's about Jesus' power and his ability. It gives us hope that circumstances can change. 
Because again, it's about Jesus and his power and his ability. Because Jesus' resurrection makes all things possible. It gives me hope for redemption. It gives me hope for restoration. It gives me hope that I can change and circumstances can change. I wanna share with you the story of two of our church members, uh, Victor and Dara. And I want you to hear how Jesus met them in the middle of some of their biggest fears, some of their darkest moments, some of the most difficult things that they face, and how Jesus gave them exactly what he gave those first disciples. He gave them his peace, gave them his power, and gave them purpose. Here's their story, watch this. There was a time in my son's life that life got tough. He had already graduated from college uh, with honors, with a degree in psychology. Um, he came back home and was saving up money to buy a property one day. I think he had a lot of negative self-talk. Um, there was probably some undealt with trauma and he started a new job that was very stressful and he found relief with street drugs. He lost his job, uh, he lost, he wrecked two cars and um, it was weighing on us at home and eventually we had to kick him out of the house. It was hopeless. I, there was nothing that we can do. We were trying different uh, things to try to get him off the drugs, and every, nothing was working. It was a, a free fall that we couldn't stop. What I felt was so much despair and sadness. I felt guilty. I felt ashamed. Um, I felt like a failure. We realized that, yeah, we didn't cause it. I mean, I mean and we couldn't cure it. And, and we couldn't control it. My nephew, who lives in Seattle, told me about a support group called the Naranon Family Groups. We started attending um, probably a, a couple months into my son's addiction. Naranon is a support group for the addict's family members. When I learned in Naranon that I could choose faith rather than fear. I am giving this whole situation to a God that is going to be with me in the darkest times and the happiest times of my life. She went to one vacation and I could, I mean, I couldn't even fathom that. I, I needed to stay close to home in case something happened with my son or needed our help. And so I didn't want to go anywhere. And finally, she says, you have to just give it up to God, give it to God. And that's what I did. And, and then I was able to start living my life again. I was allowing myself to be happy, knowing that God has got my son. You know, God has got us. But it was a choice every single day. The gift that Naranon gave to me is something that I wanted to give to others so they can find peace. But it wasn't until the Four Initiative that I felt called to start my own group. And the power of Jesus' resurrection, the power to overcome death, could save my son and save me from this pit that I was in. I knew we were going to be okay because God is with us and I know He loves us. He loves my son and it was complete surrender and complete trust in Him. I so appreciate Victor and Dara just giving us a glimpse into their life and how Jesus met them 
in some of those places of fear, in those difficult places, in that darkness, and gave them peace and a power, and then even a purpose to be able to help others. You know, their, their son is sober, but their journey is not over any more than yours or mine. Nobody's life is perfect. Everybody's life is this mixed bag. And the good news is that Jesus shows up in the middle of all of it. And he offers us his peace and he offers us his power. And then here's the third thing Jesus wants to give us. Jesus wants to give us purpose in our every day. I love how Dara and Victor have been able to take a place of pain and let Jesus into it and begin to heal it and then take that very same place and use it as a place of purpose to serve and to help others. And they've started that support group that meets right here in our church. You see, this is what Jesus does. He comes to us and gives us his peace and his power and his purpose. And then he invites us to go back out into our world where we live, where we work, where we play, where we go to school and be a part of his redemption and restoration process to be able to offer that peace and power and purpose to others. In our scripture passage, when Jesus showed up in the room and he said to those first disciples, his commissioning words, he said, as the father has sent me, so I am sending you. He was giving them the same purpose that he had, to go out and to show and share God's love with others. And did you know the whole reason we're even here today, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus 2,000 years after the scriptures that we just read, is because those first disciples didn't stay in that room. The whole reason you and I are here today The only reason you and I know Jesus' name and many of us have experienced Jesus' resurrected life in our life and we've experienced his forgiveness and grace and his peace and his power and we're trying our best imperfectly as we all do to live on his purpose is because those first disciples took Jesus' words seriously and they didn't stay in that room. They went out and they shared that good news with other people. You see, Easter is not meant to be confined to a day. It's not meant to be just one day that we celebrate. It's meant to be something we experience and we live and we share with others. Easter isn't meant to be confined in a building, in a sacred space. It's meant to be lived and shared. This is what our last scripture this Easter says. In fact, can we read this out loud together? Go ahead and put that on the screen. Colossians chapter three. Everybody in the room, everybody sitting outside, If you're upstairs in the community room, everybody online, let's all read Colossians 3, 1 together. We're reading the whole thing, not just one word. Ready, begin. Christ's resurrection is your resurrection too. Christ's resurrection, it's meant to be your resurrection too. It's meant to be something you experience, you live, and then you share with others. No matter how far you feel like you've run, no matter how locked up, your life or your heart might be, would you let Jesus do what no one else can? Jesus can show up in places no one else can and he can do what no one else can do. Because if he's resurrected and he's alive, he's the savior of the world, yours and mine. I wanna bring this to a point of application and prayer. And here's how I wanna do this. I wanna offer just two simple uh, invitations today for you to consider. Is this a, a, a spiritual next step for you? The first one is this. If you're here today and maybe you've never said yes to following Christ, you've never made a decision to say, you know what, I believe and I wanna receive what Jesus did for me. And all you have to do is have that want to in your heart. That want to, we call that faith. Faith doesn't mean perfect. All my questions are answered. Everything is understood. My, all my questions aren't answered and everything is understood. But I have a want to in my heart and Jesus has met me in those places and helped me to grow from there. And so if you're here today and you would say, you know what, I've never said yes to Christ or maybe you feel like you've been running for miles and miles or years and years and you wanna say yes to Christ today. I just wanna create a moment where you remember Easter 2024. That's when I said yes to Jesus. And so to do that, here's what I'm gonna ask just to help create a sense of privacy in the room. Uh, Whatever it is, bow their head for a moment. And uh, I'm just gonna invite you, if that's you, in just a second, to raise your hand. I'm not gonna, it's not gonna get all dramatic or weird. I'm not gonna call you out of your seat or anything. But I want you to take a physical step of raising your hand that represents a spiritual choice you're making today. 
that raising your hand, you're saying, Jesus, I'm saying yes to you. And I just want to include you in a prayer. And so if you're here today and you've never said yes to Christ, or you feel like you've been running a million miles away from him for a long time, and today Jesus is showing up and you want to push through that fear and say yes to joy. If that's you, just raise your hand all over the room, outside on the patio, up in the community room. If you're here and you're saying yes to Christ today, just raise your hand, leave it up for a second. God comes to you with all of his love and all of his grace. May you experience his peace and his power and his presence. Awesome, let me pray for us. Lord, I thank you for many friends today that are saying yes to you. And I pray that this spiritual decision would be the beginning of something new. Just like it was for Mary Magdalene when she met Jesus on that day, it started something brand new that we're still living in today, your goodness and your grace. And so I pray that for all of our friends. They would know your peace, your forgiveness, your grace, and live on a new purpose that's found in Christ. And so we celebrate your new life in them today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's celebrate a bunch of people who said yes to Christ. That's awesome. Way to go. And then here's my second invitation. With every head up and eye open, how many of us would say that we need in some area of our life Maybe you've been walking with Jesus for decades, but you would say, you know what? There's an area in my life that I could use an extra measure of peace over my fear. I could use an extra measure of power over some weakness or struggle that I'm going through. Or I could just use an extra measure to realize, you know what? I can live on purpose at my work, in my neighborhood, wherever I go, whatever I do. I just want to see that more clearly. How many of us, we could say we could use one of those three things, peace, peace, power or purpose. Just hold it up with me. I know I need those things. All right. Let me pray for all of us that have just raised our hand. In fact, would everybody stand with me? Everybody in the room, everybody outside. If you're watching online and you're still in your pajamas, really? <laughs> really? Like it's 1155, man. Like, come on. Uh, let me pray for us. And here's what I would like to do. If you're comfortable, uh, would you just put your hands in a posture like this? It's a posture of receiving. If you're not comfortable, don't worry about it. Um, and let me pray for us. Lord, we stand here with open hands representing open lives and open hearts. And Lord, I pray for every single one of us today. I pray that we would receive your peace, your power, and your purpose. That this Easter, God, wouldn't be just something we celebrate, but it is a savior to be experienced. It is a life to be lived, and it is all the goodness of God to be shared with others. And so, God, I pray this for every single one of us this Easter. May the resurrection of Christ be our resurrection, too. In Jesus' name, amen.